going to open for us in prayer. Welcome to everybody. Welcome to the second lecture of our next uh, module. If we can ask uh, people when you come on, if you wouldn't mind muting your your microphones, um, otherwise it does interfere in the in the recording. So um, I am trying to do that with some people, but it's not allowing me to. So unfortunately, I'm going to have to take that person off and they're going to have to come back in with their microphone off. Okay. Sorry about that. Let's open in prayer. Thank you, Lord and Heavenly Father, that we can come today and we can learn of your word and we can receive revelation. I pray, Lord, that even as uh, we go into the basic things of the word, that in that, Lord, you are going to bring the meat out, that you're going to bring us to the revelation that you want us to see in your word. I pray for every person that will be watching this on YouTube, even for those students, maybe that will be catching up. I pray, Lord, that there will be a blessing upon this for them. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you and welcome to all of you. Uh, today, we're doing the fourth chapter of the subject of knowing God's welcome voice. Welcome to everybody on uh, Vida Radio. We now have the lecture um, of Dr. Tony. So if you're coming on, uh, this is live for you. Thank you. Thank you then. So we're looking at chapter four of the module dealing with the subject of knowing God's voice. And the title of this uh, lesson is Heading the Wrong Direction. Uh, the intention is that you would be able to remember this key verse, which is there, uh, Jeremiah 10, 23 on the page. Oh, Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Uh, so very often people are living according to the circumstances around them unless the Lord is guiding their steps. Um, but we will learn the non-biblical methods of seeking guidance, um, and we will distinguish between false and true prophets of God, and we will also de define the word emulations, emulations. That's included in this chapter. So it's just as important to know how not to do something as it is to know how to do it. So in the future, we do not have to waste time using methods which did not work, but there are uh, purposes in understanding uh, the difference between uh, false guidance and the true guidance from the Lord himself. So in the Bible, God warns of ways we should not seek guidance for our lives. Many people will consult uh, the spirit world, uh, but it will not be godly and it will not be biblical to do it their way. So we are not going to waste time with non-biblical methods of guidance, which uh, God does not approve, uh, because they will prevent you from making, this will prevent you from making bad decisions if you understand the wrong way to go and you steer clear of heading the wrong direction in life. In other chapters, you'll learn how God revealed his will in the past and how he speaks to men in present times. But first, we must eliminate the negatives. These are the ways you should not seek guidance. And the first is the occult. There are numerous satanic practices that are gathered together under this uh, subject or heading of the occult. Many of these practices are used to determine guidance. They vary from nation to nation, but they include, uh, sub, uh, in, include consulting witches, shaman, witch doctors, sorcerers, magicians, fortune tellers, astrology, that's reading, reading the stars, uh, horoscopes, that's what you read in the newspapers where they, uh, they give you um, a forecast of your fortune for that day, depending on what uh, month of the year you are born. Um, the reading of tea leaves, the reading of crystals, and then reading of tarot cards, uh, and then reading the palm of the hand, the, the, uh, the uh, fold lines in your hand. Um, so we see that occult practice um, include any form of supernatural involvement which is not of God. They are motivated by Satan 
and the false gods. God warned his people not to deal with occult practices. You can indeed read these warnings in Deuteronomy 8, 18 and Exodus 22. So we're just going to have, have a quick look at that. Deut Deuteronomy 18. Let's just see what have you got. Uh, verses 9 to 14 and Exodus 22, 18. So we'll look at Deuteronomy 18. And let's just move those. Okay. Uh, verses 9 to 14. When you come into the land of the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abomination of those nations. They shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all these, all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of those abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. And that's the promise that God made to drive out uh, of Canaan, uh, the people that were practicing these occult practices. Um, the Lord said to his people, you shall be blameless before the Lord your God. For these nations which you will dispossess, listened to soothsayers and diviners, but as for you, the Lord your God has not appointed such for you. And then, of course, Exodus uh, 22. Is that right? Exodus 22, verse 18. Twenty-two, verse 18. It says, you shall not permit a sorceress to live. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. And that means that if any one of the Hebrew families or the Israelites became a sorceress, they were to put them to death. So this is how severe God saw that practice and the, uh, the sins of witchcraft. Um, because it is a, is a spiritual rebellion against God. Um, witchcraft is the practice of witches, including white and black magic. Sorcery, astrology, voodoo, use of potions, spells, enchantments, and drugs. It includes all similar satanic practices and worship. Uh, for example, um, some witch doctors and some um, uh, people have a custom where they will inhale um, smoke from uh, burning dacha or uh, yeah, burning dacha and uh, burning cannabis. And uh, it, it is a drug that uh, takes them into a trance. All of those practices the Lord is against. It includes all similar satanic practices and worship. So witchcraft and other such practices are spiritual rebellion against God. And the Lord said through Samuel, he said to, to Saul, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So the Bible records that sorcerers tried to turn people away from the gospel. Even in Acts chapter 13, um, Paul's experience was that Elimas the sorcerer, he stood against them. He, he opposed uh, the apostles Saul and Barnabas, and he sought to turn away the deputy from the faith. The deputy was receiving the word and turning to faith, but uh, Elima, Elimas tried to uh, turn him away. Witchcraft deceives people. Um, Revelation 18.23 says, by thy sorceries were all the nations deceived. Sorceries will not enter, or sorcerers will not enter the kingdom of heaven, um, because it says they're going to be outside, for outside or without are sorcerers. The book of Revelation reveals the end of those who practice such satanic rituals, but sorcerers shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. So no true child of God should be involved in any way with occult practices for the purposes of guidance or any other reason. So methods of chance. Casting lots was one method of seeking guidance used in the Old Testament. You can read about this in Leviticus 16, 7 to 10, or Numbers 26, 55, 27, 21, and Joshua 18, 10. Um, I'd like you to read those scriptures in your own time. The casting of lots was a method of chance. The belief was that God controlled the outcome of the lot which was cast. Casting lots was similar to the rolling of dice or flipping of a coin today. This method of seeking guidance from God 
was acceptable in the Old Testament. The only New Testament example of casting of lots by believers was prior to the coming of the Holy Spirit. The apostles of Jesus were seeking to fill the vacancy left by Judas, who betrayed Jesus and later committed suicide. So two candidates were nominated for the position. It says, and they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the 11 apostles. That's in Acts chapter 126. So Matthias, Matthias the man picked to replace Jesus, mm -hmm. is never again mentioned in the New Testament. It is the apostle Paul who actually fills the vacancy upon, among the apostles. Matthias was man's choice by casting lots. The apostle Paul was God's choice by the Holy Spirit. So after the coming of the Holy Spirit, that's in Acts chapter 2, the casting of lots was not used by believers as a means of determining direction. The guidance of the Holy Spirit replaced this Old Testament way of uh, getting guidance. So you should not use any method of chance to determine God's will. You must know God's voice and be led by the Holy Spirit. So there is an example in the Old Testament of fleeces where Gideon used a fleece. Um, it, it's called uh, a, a way that Gideon used a fleece to determine God's will. Remember the story in Jude, Judges 6, how the Lord spoke to Gideon and told him uh, to go and to burn down the idols, uh, his father's idols in his hometown. And um, he wanted a confirmation from the Lord. So he said, I want to um, ask you to confirm this is a word from you. And I want you to cause the dew to fall on the fleece, but not on the ground. And then the second night he asked for a confirmation where the dew would fall on the ground, but not on the, on the fleece. And on both tests, the Lord confirmed his will for Gideon to go and start his campaign by um, cutting down all of the uh, statues uh, and the idols uh, of Baal that his father had allowed to be erected in their village. So there's no verse in the Bible that instructs us to do as Gideon did. Um, this was a national crisis in Gideon's generation, and a great responsibility rested on him that the Lord um, uh, chose him to uh, carry out the deliverance of his nation from the Midianites. But this only occurred once, uh, and as the casting of lots was only once recorded in the Bible. So it, it was also used only before the New Testament outpouring of the holy spirit uh, we're not seeking god's will by putting out a fleece we don't do that modern putting out of a fleece is usually done by saying if a certain thing happens then i will know it is god's will but our fleeces are often things that could occur naturally in the one case a fleece recorded in the bible gideon already knew god's will he'd heard the voice of god the fleece was used as a confirmation not for new direction it was also something that could be answered only by supernatural means. So in the New Testament days, when Zacharias the priest asked for a sign to confirm the angel Gabriel's message to him about the birth of John the Baptist, he was struck dumb. This was because he did not believe the voice of God and he sought a sign in Luke chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. So Zacharias was struck dumb by the angel and um, he could not speak again until the child was born. And the only um, time he spoke was when he named the child John, which is what the angel had told him would be the name of his son. So Jesus said that an evil and an adulterous generation seeks after a sign. A fleece can be a sign of unbelief, in fact, or unwillingness to do God's revealed will. Fleeces, which can be answered through natural means, can be deceptive and misleading. So on occasion, God has graciously answered those who have asked for some indications of what they should do by a fleece or by a sign. But this practice has been the exception rather than the rule. God wants men of faith, not of fleeces. He wants men and women who know his voice when he speaks and have no need to test it by confirming signs. Um, my first experience of that was... I remember that there was a Christian guest farm 
uh, near Nelspreet or um, Mbombela in South Africa. And I know, remember a friend of mine was on his way to visit a family that had moved to Nelspreet and they were pastoring a small church in Nelspreet. And this uh, friend of mine wanted to go and visit them. So he got in his car and he rode all the way. And on the way near to Nelspreet, he passed the farm called a Come Together, which is a guest farm, which was used for Christian camps and for youth uh, camps and, uh, and so on. And uh, he says that as he approached the entrance to go to pass uh, the come together, his engine stalled and he could not get it started. And so he realized he was next to the entrance to come together. So he walked up to the Christian guest farm and it was about dinner time. And who should he meet there um, at dinner? But the friends that he wanted to meet in Nelspreet and they had left home and they had stopped overnight to meet their friends at the Come Together guest farm and they were having dinner and the next morning they would be on their way to Johannesburg and my friend said it was an angel that stopped the car so that I could meet them and not miss them that weekend but I even asked myself the question at the time because the Lord had started to teach me when I heard that testimony the Lord had started to teach me about hearing his voice to stop and go where he wanted me to go to to stop or uh, somewhere or to go to a different place take a turn in a different way and that has started happening to me and I said uh, surely it would have been easier if my friend had been listening to the Lord for him to say just turn in here and he would not have questioned if he was led by the spirit he would have just turned in right just to think well who will I find here that the Lord wants me to meet and of course he did find the, per the people that he wanted to meet himself and the Lord didn't want him to miss them so he uh, stopped it somehow by an angel because when he went back to his car it started and he just pulled it in to come together and he stayed the night there and then he went home because uh, the friends he wanted to spend time with were on their way to another engagement in Johannesburg so these are the sort of things that uh, by the the, um, the the grace of God the Lord does do to people that are not listening to the guidance of the Holy Spirit <clears throat> Generally, the Lord wants us to know his voice when he speaks, and we do not have to test it by confirming signs. We need to act in obedience and faith. Another uh, false thing that we should uh, be aware of is false prophets. There are many stories in the Bible of prophets of God, uh, but the Bible also reveals that God sets leaders in the church known as prophets and explains the spiritual gift of the Holy Spirit known as prophecy. That's in Ephesians chapter 4, 11, that the Lord has set in the church prophets. And in 1 Corinthians 12, 10, that prophecy is one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. So to prophesy, the verb is prophesy, the noun is prophecy. Um, when a person brings a prophecy, he is prophesying. So to prophesy is to speak under the special inspiration of God. That word special inspiration means the anointing that inspires us, the anointing of the Holy Spirit that inspires us and releases the truths or the pictures or the words that he wants us to share with the people that can hear us speak. So it's a special ability to receive and to communicate an immediate message of God to his people through a divinely anointed utterance. There is a difference between a, a word of prophecy that is anointed by the Spirit and prophecies that are not anointed by the Spirit. And you can, as a Spirit-led believer, you can detect the difference between a prophecy with an anointing and a prophecy that is not carrying that anointing. Um, so the words spoken by a prophet under divine inspiration are called prophecies. To prophesy means to declare openly words from God that exhort, edify, and comfort. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, But he that prophesies speaks unto men. What has happened here? I don't need that. Don't know why that's coming on. Let me try and get rid of it. Yes, okay. Um, so Paul writes that uh, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 3, but I just want to show you something that in uh, 1 Corinthians 14, um, uh, 
So 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4 says, He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Because he says, he who prophesies speaks edification and ex exhortation, that means encouragement and comfort to men. Now, this is the, the, the formula for judging prophecy that are that is generally given by someone who is been given a gift of prophecy but paul says if i come to you now remember that paul was operating mostly as a teacher but sometimes as a prophet and he was one of the team of leaders in antioch chapter 13 uh, acts chapter 13 um, there were five of them and Saul and Barnabas were in that leadership ministry team and they were called prophets and teachers. So we know that there is a difference between the ministry of a person who has the gift of prophecy and a person who is a gift ministry prophet. Um, and so Paul could operate as a gift ministry prophet or as a gift ministry teacher uh, at different times. And he says, Verse six, let's look at what he says in, sorry, um, verse six. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you unless I speak to you either by revelation, by knowledge, by prophesying? So prophesying there would include edification, exhortation, and comfort to men, but revelation would include the word of knowledge would include the word of wisdom, would include the gift of the discerning of spirits, and would also include the, the preaching of the word with the Holy Spirit in uh, giving him revelation according to uh, John chapter 16, where the Holy Spirit would speak words to him, to Paul, to say in his teachings or in his preaching. Okay, and that's that's the anointing of a preacher or the anointing of a teacher is that the Holy Spirit gives us words to say that sometimes we've not planned to say, but when we speak, it, it comes out as wisdom from God with anointing that imparts grace to the hearers. So Paul says that uh, there's more to the gift ministry that he was either a prophet or a teacher that had the capacity to come with revelation or with knowledge or with prophesy prophesying or with teaching. So um, a gift ministry prophet has got the ability to come and bring new revelation and to bring direction and to deal with foundational issues and to sort out um, uh, controversy and conflict in the churches to establish a foundation of truth so that peace is restored in the churches. That's the gift of the ministry gifts of apostle and prophet. So I'm, I just wanted to bring that in because this is the position that most pastors take they say that um that prophecy where is where is that here we are um there we are the most pastors understand that prophecy is supposed to exhort edify and comfort or encourage is the word the modern word for exhort um, but I've just explained to you that Paul was a gift ministry that could operate as a prophet or a teacher, and he would operate in more than just prophecy like this. So he would be speaking prophetically as a gift ministry that included bringing direction and bringing uh, out um, uh, resolution of problems or bringing and bringing a correction, divine correction, just as John the Apostle wrote the letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, chapter two and three. All of those were prophecies that the Lord Jesus Christ himself dictated to John to send to the seven churches as letters from John, but capturing the words of the great apostle and the great prophet, our Lord Jesus Christ. So prophecy is used by gift ministry apostles and prophets to bring correction as well. Okay, so the prophesy is to speak under a special inspiration of God. And this is how it happens. But he that prophesies speaks unto men edification, exhortation, and comfort, but prophecy never replaces the written word of God. So the, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit gives the words of the prophecy. It will edify, it will encourage, and it will comfort. And as I said, as a gift ministry, like Paul, it could sometimes correct, it could resolve problems, it could uncover foundational uh, uh, issues and bring redirection uh, to uh, the whole congregation through the gift ministry. Uh, but it never replaces the written word of God. It will always bring us back 
to the truth of the words that are recorded for us that the Lord gave us by the Holy Spirit inspiring the gospel writers as well as the Old Testament prophets and the books of the Old Testament. So it, prophecy never replaces the written word of God. Bible says prophecy will cease, but the word of God abides forever. And that's correct. All right. So you can check out those two scriptures yourself. In the Old Testament, people went to prophets for guidance. I think I just want to uh, add in this verse here so that you can uh, you can remember that, and I will. If I don't do it now, I shall probably forget to put it in for you. Let's just get it here, um, and we're just going to also see uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 6. Okay. And we'll put that in the, I'll just highlight that. Okay. <clears throat> in the Old Testament, people would go to a prophet for guidance because the gift of the Holy Spirit infilling was not yet given. So it's no longer necessary to go to a prophet to receive spiritual guidance. This is one of the functions of the Holy Spirit in your life as a believer. Each believer should learn to be led by God's Spirit. So the New Testament gives no record of believers seeking guidance from prophets after the gift of the Holy Spirit was given. But God still uses this gift to confirm the future. So you can study such an example in Acts 21 verse 1 to 14, where the prophet Abacus, uh, Agabus, the prophet Agab Agabus gave Paul a personal prophecy that was specifically for Paul's life. Paul already knew what awaited him in Jerusalem, that he awaited, that he knew that uh, he was going to be arrested and that he would be treated ill by the Jews. But the prophecy of Agabus only confirmed what would happen there. It was not a prophecy of guidance telling Peter, uh, sorry, telling Paul whether or not to go to Jerusalem. So the Bible warns of false prophets in the world. In Matthew 24, 11 and 24, Mark 13, 22. Let's just have a quick look at those. Matthew 24, 11 and 22. So there's 11. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And unless those days were shorted, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Um, and he said, if anyone says to you, look, here is Christ, or there do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. So we have to be careful to identify false prophets. And then we look at the other scripture, which is Mark 13, 22. <clears throat> And it says, for false Christs and false prophets will rise and show signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. But take heed. See, I have told you all things beforehand. So one of the f ways that we avoid uh, um, false prophets it's, and accepting false prophets is we compare what they say with the word of God. The other way that we, comp we uh, test them is uh, does it agree with the witness of the Spirit in our hearts? And the third way is, does it agree with what's written in the Scriptures? Um, it says, before, because of this false risk of false prophets, God has always provided ways to identify true prophecies. So we compare the true with the false. Then this is one of the ways that we uh, are to um, carry this out in the church, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. And there's an explanation here about in proportion of faith means in right relation to the faith. Now, I want to once again bring to your attention the fact that in the evangelical churches, the evangelical churches refer to this phrase, the faith, 
They refer to the scripture which says that we must contend for the faith that was once delivered to the apostles or once delivered to the saints. Um, but the, the word the faith means the way that they believed God in that first generation and the way that they experienced the new dimension of grace that can only be accessed by faith. Even uh, in Ephesians 2 verse 8, it tells us, for by grace you are saved through faith and that gift of faith is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so what the, uh, the phrase, the faith, is talking about is the faith that the apostles experienced, the faith that Jesus used when he explained to his uh, disciples in Mark 11. He explained to them about the effect of his words where he said to the fig tree, um, no man eat fruit of you ever again. And then at the end of the day, when they passed the fig tree, it had withered up and died. And they said, look, master, the fig tree that you're cursed, it is dry and withered. And the Lord Jesus answered to explain what had happened. He said, have the faith of God. That's in the, new, in the original New Testament Greek. Have the faith of God. You can check that in Young's literal translation. Um, but of course, the theologians nowadays um, have interpreted the Greek and they changed it to have faith in God. Let me tell you that the understanding in the mind of having faith in God is totally different to the experience of receiving by the Spirit of God the faith of God. Because Paul tells us that um, we have got the same spirit of faith. And that is that we say, I have believed and therefore I do speak. So he's talking about faith that operates in a dimension of the supernatural. And the way that you release the supernatural is when the Holy Spirit gives you the words to speak that will open the supernatural up. You obey the Holy Spirit and you speak those words with faith and that releases miracles and healings and re uh, releases the word of God to people in prophecy. And that's what we mean by in proportion of faith in our experience. So um, what you have to be careful about then, I'm not sure how to capture this, but let's just, let's just do this. We'll capture it in 2 Corinthians 4, 13. Sorry, 1, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 13. Yes, I think that's correct. Um, and there we are. And since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what I believe and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. So let's just copy that. And we're just going to put it in here. Um, okay. So I'm just going to put it in here. Uh, let's get this. No, I've got to do this. Come on, there we go. Okay, so this is the faith. This is the faith that the New Testament talks about, according to the proportion of faith. It's the four. If you've got faith to speak out prophecy, then that adds a dimension to release the anointing of the Holy Spirit to people that hear it. <clears throat> if you don't have faith, then you will <clears throat> you will very often hear people nowadays say, um, I, "I've got this impression," or "I feel that uh, this is." what's happening to you. But a true word of knowledge uh, is comes over with such authority and the word of um, prophecy uh, speaks healing, it speaks deliverance, it speaks uh, victory, and it speaks um, uh, solutions to people with a confidence that only comes um, by the Holy Spirit giving you the anointing. So, um, I just want you to see the difference there from that scripture, 2 Corinthians 14. We have received that same spirit of faith. 
which is the spirit of faith that David had, because this is a quote from the Psalms. And we have the same faith given to us by the Holy Spirit that the that the um, apostles had. So that's the kind of faith that he's talking about here. All right. Um, so. And I want to just say, uh, let's put it in here. <clears throat> Um, I think I need to, let's just, let me just correct that. Okay, I want this to go up there. There we go. Okay, this is like this is like uh, writing on the blackboard when you're doing a lesson with the with the students in the classroom. Okay, so. Um, the, another explanation of according to the proportion of faith is when you start off with prophecy then it's a very timid experience where you you you're cautious to you want to do the right thing you want to say the right things you want to be led by the spirit and you want to speak the words the holy spirit has given you and that's good um but as you uh, become more experienced in prophecy you get a confidence which grows and then your faith will be stretched and the holy spirit will give you tasks um to use the word of the gift of prophecy and the gift of prophecy actually opens up all of the other gifts of revelation and the gifts of power the, the gift of prophecy opens up the word of knowledge the word of uh, wisdom and the discerning of spirits the real the real uh, point about it is that if you get a word of knowledge in your heart and mind it, it does not help anybody unless you speak it out and speaking it out is the gift of prophecy. All right. So prophecy is used to release the gifts of the, uh, of revelation and as well as the gifts of power. That's the working of miracles and working of healing, miracles of, uh, of healing and um, uh, the actual gift of faith to do supernatural things beyond your own ability of faith. So the, the gift of prophecy is a very important gift to uh, work with and to understand that it is given to you with the anointing of the power of the Holy Spirit and you can grow in the dimensions of faith with your prophecies. So the, another thing uh, that is a safeguard in the churches is let the prophets speak two or three and let the other judge. Now this is in a set of uh, guidelines that or boundaries that Paul wanted to set up in the Corinthian church and he said, look, uh, when you come together in a celebration meeting and you've got everybody's got a tongue, everybody's got a revelation, everybody's got a prophecy. What you need to do is to limit it to two or three tongues with interpretation and two or three prophecies bringing that the prophets bring. But every one of those utterances must be judged by the others who are prophets in the room. And so this is the guidance of the Apostle Paul uh, that he um, set as a scriptural uh, um, standard of how to function with the gift of prophecy in a large meeting. So we're told to judge prophecies. The standard for the judgment of prophecies is the word of God. God has provided many ways to recognize false prophets, and they are known because of what they speak does not come to pass. And Deuteronomy explains that Moses tells the people, uh, if a prophet presumes to speak a word in God's name, which he's not com been commanded to speak, or that the prophet should speak in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. That means that the people must recognize it and must put him to death. And if you say in your heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? And then he says, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, the thing, if the thing does not follow, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. But the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. He is presumed in his heart that he can speak it and the people will believe it as the word of God. But if it does not come to pass, he says, you shall not be afraid of him. In fact, the uh, previous verse says that they should put him to death. 
Um, so I want you to study the following references in your own Bible, that false prophets do not confess the deity of Jesus. They don't accept the deity of Jesus Christ uh, over their own lives, the Lordship of Jesus Christ. False prophets teach false doctrine. That's one of the things that happens when uh, some prophets uh, have uh, signs or um, accurate prophecies uh, in terms of words of knowledge for people. But if they are false, then they will be seen to have a false position in doctrine. False prophets lead people away from the obedience to God's word. Um, that's one of the results of their ministry. False prophets deceive people with miraculous signs. Even though there be miraculous signs, they may have started off in the spirit like the Galatian Christians, but they, once they've re received a gift and they, they have confidence to function in the gift of the spirit, sometimes they go off at a tangent of their own, choosing their own course, and the gift still operates. I know of one internationally known man from the U uh, USA that is continuing to do that, and he is living in sin with other women uh, in his team. And he's continuing to operate in some signs and wonders, and he's still getting openings to go and minister in churches because those churches do not know his, of his behavior. Um, false prophets make false claims. They claim that things will come to pass, and they do not come to pass. So their fruit reveals their error. One of the best ways to distinguish false prophets from true prophets is to observe, observe their lives. What is their behavior like? Their, by their fruits, you shall know them. You will identify them if they are not people that are uh, showing the fruits of the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the fruit of the Spirit that, uh, that overcomes the works of the flesh and that actually uh, replaces the works of the flesh in a Christian whose life has been crucified with Christ and they're living by the life of Christ now. So false prophets do not have the evidence of spiritual fruit in their own lives. So because there are some false prophecies in, in, in the world, we must be cautious to accept prophecies. Prophecy often, often has been misused to direct people and to control them. So when personal prophecy is given, it should be examined in relation to scriptures and it should agree with the written word of God. So in regards to guidance, Prophecy should be confirming, not directing or controlling. So because of misuse of the spiritual gift, some believers reject it totally. Now, I know that there are some prophecies, and I've, I've met a lot of prophets in my lifetime, and there are genuine five-fold ministry prophets that do give guidance that is new information. And there's nothing wrong with that, because certain people that would receive the word from a true prophet have been people that have been seeking God, seeking his will, seeking which way they should go. And then the prophet comes along and the Holy Spirit recognizes their hunger and their uh, way that they prepared themselves uh, to be willing to do whatever the Lord says. And he gives the word to the prophet to give them new information. So the position of uh, rejecting new information from a prophet is different to receiving a new information from somebody that just has the gift of prophecy, all right? Because a prophet has, um, has grown into maturity where they understand the implications of releasing the words of God into people's lives and into churches. You can devastate a church by bringing the wrong word or bringing a word too early or revealing um, personal facts that the Spirit has shown you and it embarrasses the person and immediately that closes their heart so they cannot receive the grace, they get offended. And so the, the prophets have come to learn <clears throat> how to, uh, to walk in wisdom and in love and truth and how to speak words that would minister to the individual and not disclose them or expose them um, uh, to, the, uh, to embarrass them. <clears throat> So because of uh, misuse, the spiritual gift of prophecy uh, uh, has been rejected by some believers. They will not accept the miraculous gift of prophetic utterance. You should not reject the ministry of the Holy Spirit because you, a few uh, carnal examples of uh, prophetic um, errors and prophetic mistakes uh, in some carnal uh, people. So uh, we have to be careful and use these tests uh, that we've talked about here to identify 
the difference between true prophets and, and false prophets and true prophecies and false prophecies. The wrong counsel is another area where people can be misguided. Uh, no man can determine God's will for someone else except in matters specifically revealed for, in the Bible. For example, <clears throat> we know that it's God's will that all should come to repentance. Uh, Peter says that. Um, I think James also says that. And Paul says that. Spiritual counseling by godly leaders, however, has a definite place in the guidance of a believer, but no counselor has the right to control another person or to determine God's will for him or her in matters not dealt with in the scriptures. So when the apostle Paul was determined to go to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem, his friends at Caesarea tried to prevent him from doing so. They warned of the serious trouble that would come. And Paul rejected their counsel and went on to Jerusalem because he knew the will of God in his heart. And they accepted his decision, saying the will of the Lord be done. So they realized that even though it was their personal desire that he should not leave them, Paul must determine God's will for himself. So it's important for you to come to know God's voice for yourself. You cannot trust others to guide your life because there are evil spirits in the world whose intent is to deceive. We are even warned by John the Apostle in 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God or not. So when you receive counsel from another person, that counsel or that guidance should be tested against other methods of determining God's will, which will be detailed in later chapters of this study. So now we're going to look at emulations. What, what is the word emulations? It's a fancy um, English word, and it's used that way in the King James Version. Um, and let's see. Let me just show you that. Um, I'm going to close this one, and then we're going to use Galatians 5. Galatians 5. And then we're going to add in the King James Version. Okay, so the King James Version is in the brown font. And we're going to go to verse 19, um, I think. Okay. And then we can see there in the brown font, the old authorized King James Version, these are the works of the flesh. Look, verse 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Starts with adultery, fornication, etc. And it goes on with idolatry, witchcraft. So you see the flesh can do witchcraft. The flesh in man is uh, inclined to reach out to the spiritual uh, dimension. But if they're not born again, they will, in, they will reach out and receive and accept um, uh, a spiritual input or downloads from the dark side or from uh, ungodly spirits. Um, and so we read on and see that hatred is the work of the flesh, variance and emulations is the work of the flesh. Well, what does emulations mean? It means trying to copy somebody because you're jealous of them. And the, the uh, new King James Version has translated the word jealousies. You're jealous of somebody because they've got something that you want. And uh, emulations means that you are so jealous that you want to be like them, but you're, you don't want to learn from them. You want to actually um, do better than them. You're jealous of them. Okay. So that's what emulations mean. So the emula emulation is the desire to copy others and to equal or excel them. It stems from a spirit of rivalry and it is a form of jealousy. So some believers emulate the successful ministries of others instead of seeking God's plan for their own lives. No two believers has the same work to do. The Holy Spirit calls people into specific ministries that are different. Because in Acts 13, 2, remember, as the, uh, the, the ministry team uh, of prophets and apostles in verse 1 of Acts 13, as they ministered to the Lord, they fasted and the Holy Ghost spoke through them and said, separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work unto which I've called them. So the Bible states that they that believers have differing gifts. Uh, Saul and Barnabas had to be separated um, because the Holy Spirit was about to release them to be gift ministry apostles. And because he was about to release a new dimension of uh, a truth and of grace in their lives. 
which would uh, bring revelation for ministering to the Gentiles and would also bring power for performing signs and wonders to confirm the gospel that they would preach. So the Bible says that believers have differing spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 4 and 11 says there are diversities of gifts, but all these works with that one and self same spirit dividing to every man se differently severally or differently as he wills the holy spirit decides who to give what spiritual gifts to whom that they would operate uh, most uh, uh, successfully in and some uh, some people have got different what i call gift clusters some have got gift clusters of um, the gifts of utterance that would be tongues to interpretation and prophecy and the word of knowledge or the discerning of spirits um, and or, or they've got the uh, gifts of power uh, that operate as well. So um, an evangelist, for example, would very often have um, the gifts of healing and the gifts of working of miracles or the word of knowledge to release those uh, healings and the miracles. Um, so although we are told to covet earnestly the best gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 31, and to desire spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 14, 1, it doesn't mean we are to imitate others who have significant ministries. Um, what I think that is that we very often do get caught up to follow the way that certain ministries do things and then we're trying to copy them. That is not um, going to automatically release the anointing of the spirit on you. Um, you may start off trying to do what those people do, but the Holy Spirit will take you in your own direction, and you're going to find out that it's a dimension of faith that you have to grow in so that you can operate in the gifts that release signs, of signs and wonders. So when Peter was concerned about what ministry John would do in, uh, in the beach meeting with Jesus after he was resurrected and before he went to heaven in John chapter 21, when he asked uh, about what did, what what is this man John going to do? Jesus said, what is that to thee? You follow me. So John had a different ministry to Peter. Uh, once again, we, we see that God gave Noah the plan for an ark. He gave Moses the plan for the tabernacle. He gave Solomon the plan for a great temple of worship. Nehemiah was given the plan to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. But God has not told you to be, build an ark or construct a temple or build walls around the city of Jerusalem. But God has a special plan for you. So if you fall into the sin of emulations to imitate any one of the others, you will miss his plan for you. This is what um, Dr. Nicholas and uh, my, I myself have been called to do, what we're doing with you now. And that is to bring uh, training, Bible training to you and university courses so that you can be equipped uh, with the uh, correct guidance and from the scriptures, but we will also be bringing to other people that are uh, that ha are aspiring business leaders. We'll be bringing business studies, and we'll be bringing training uh, for people that can be leaders outside the four walls of the church. Um, and this is the gift that the Lord has given us to be able to communicate with you in Zambia. Um, and you in Johannesburg when I'm sitting in Cape Town and Nicholas is sitting in Johannesburg. So th this, this has come together this year in such a quick way and such a wonderful way with open doors, uh, both in the south of Zambia at Future Hope Church uh, and, and their network of churches, Future Hope Churches International, as well as with uh, uh, Apostle Richard in Ndola, who um, has opened his heart and his uh, network of friends that we've also uh, had meetings and we have people with um, uh, us from that grouping from the north of Zambia as well as Lusaka. So um, we've got a special plan that has been given to Dr. Nicholas and ourselves and we want to share that so that you can be used by the Lord to raise many disciples to the level of fivefold gift ministry because that's what's lacking is we're lacking the, the making of disciples to the level of five-fold ministries. And God is going to make it possible for you as uh, we walk together over the next few years in that exercise of developing people into the five-fold ministry. So when you pattern your life after the lives of others, you become engulfed by human tradition, and human tradition conceals divine revelation. 
So I think that that's the end of this chapter. And so it would be good for us to have a, a five minute break. Um, let's go to, um, yeah, let's go to 12 minutes past eight and then uh, we can go, th go through to chapter five. Is that okay, Dr. Nicholas? Yes, that's 100%, Tony. Okay, 12 past, we'll be back at 12 past eight. So this is chapter five, and the title of this chapter is The Pattern of God's Will. The objectives of this are that we'll understand the basic facts about the will of God, and we'll identify two major divisions of God's will, and we'll use God's written word to make decisions in life situations. And we'll also be able to explain the pattern of God's will, the way that God works with people, and identify an illustration of the believers developing conformity to God's will. And we'll do a further study of the revealed will of God in the written word. So the key verses are <clears throat> in Ephesians 1 from 9 to 11. It says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will. Excuse me, I've got a frog in my throat. <clears throat> now, that's an old English saying, a frog in the throat. <laughs> that's an old English saying. <clears throat> having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he's purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. So the Lord wants to make his will known to us, and he has, has chosen to release the mystery of his will to us. And so he uh, is revealing his will so that we may align ourselves to be able to participate with him because he works all things after the counsel of his own will. All right, so the introduction is you must have some basic knowledge about the will of God to be able to understand how God uh, uses men and methods and language to speak to man to reveal his will. So the previous chapters define what is meant by the will of God and identify ways of seeking guidance which are wrong. This chapter presents basic facts about the will of God and explains two major divisions of that will, examines the pattern of God's will and discusses the believer's development in knowing the voice of God. So here are some facts about God's will. Firstly, God wants you to know his will. And that is um, that is founded on two foundational facts. Firstly, the belief that God has a plan for you. And secondly, the ability of God to communicate to you. So our faith is based on, okay, there we've got um, load shedding now. So um, I've got the standby light and you can still see my face, which is good. So our faith is, is based on the belief that God's got a plan for us and that he's able to speak or communicate to you and me. The follow, following two chapters explain methods by which God does that in communicating with man. And as we've mentioned in the previous lesson, God wants to communicate to man so much that he actually used a donkey to speak to the prophet Balaam on one occasion in Numbers 22. So the Bible commands, wherefore do not be unwise, do not, or wherefore be ye not unwise. Another modern way to say it is do not be unwise, but be understanding what the will of the Lord is. It's in Ephesians 5, 17. So Paul wrote to the Colossians, in Colossians 1 9, for this cause also, we, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and desire that you might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Again, in Acts, Ananias spoke to Paul. The, this, the text says in Acts, Paul spoke to one man, and it's, um, it's, it's uh, a little bit obscure because the words are the words of Ananias in Acts 22 14. So Ananias spoke these words to Saul, 
and said to Saul, the God of our fathers has chosen thee that thou shouldst know his will and see that just one, see that just one or see Jesus and should hear the voice of his mouth. So in addition to these verses that are examples of the Lord wanting to speak and actually speaking to Saul, God has given many promises of guidance in his written word. Uh, we'll look at some of these later. And on the basis of these scriptures, it can be concluded that God does want us to know his will. God's will is planned. God is working in this world to bring to pass all things on the basis of his plan. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. That's Ephesians 1.11. So you and I have been chosen by God. And the Holy Spirit has drawn us to turn to Christ, and he has predestined us according to his own purpose to work all things after the counsel of his will. So it, it's uh, logical, it makes sense that it's best for us to find out what is the will of God specifically for our lives, so that we will not waste years of our lives doing the wrong thing or going in the wrong direction. God then has an overall plan for the universe which he is already working out. We call this his master plan. He also has an individual, an individual plan for each person. Those plans fall within this sovereign plan of God and within his moral will. So there's his overall plan for the universe. And that overall plan for the universe is, is so immense that it includes all of the new stars that are being birthed even in these days, they're identifying new stars and new galaxies that are emerging. And I believe that God is still creating them. But at the same time, his creative plan includes every tiniest insect, the ant, the beetles, the spiders, the tiny uh, um, reptiles and the tiny animals. Every single one of them of the, in their own species have got their own instincts and their own way of doing things. Uh, Proverbs says, consider the ant, you lazy one, uh, who lays up his food in the summer for the wintertime. And so God has worked all of these things together in his overall sovereign plan, sovereign plan for the universe, the physical material universe around us. But he's more interested in us in our individual lives and his plan for our lives to accomplish his divine purposes beyond the material world as well as in the material world. So God's plan for us is in agreement with his sovereign plan and in agreement with his moral uh, will. God's plan is individual and personal. God's will for you includes his sovereign plan of redemption. The scripture in 2 Peter 3, 9 says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, uh, but is, is long suffering toward us, not willing that any of us should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But God's plan goes beyond the revelation of his sovereign and moral wills. God has an individual plan for each purpose, sorry, for each person, which he seeks to communicate to us. The Bible confirms this. By many stories of God at work in the lives of people, he placed men in specific situations at exact times for special purposes. Each of the life stories recorded in the Bible is unique. God told the prophet Jeremiah, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And before you came out of the womb, I sanctified you and ordained you. That's Jeremiah chapter one, verse five. And what, the great, what greater witness is there to the personal plan of God for an individual? I'm just going to uh, give you an example of the, the prophetic revelation of the call of the Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophetic revelation, revelation of Christ uh, in the Psalms. So we're going to look at Psalm, uh, uh, at Hebrews 10, 5 and Psalm 40, verse 6. So let's just open another um pain here we're going to go to psalm 40 verse 6 here let's get rid of the blue 40 verse 6 sacrifice an offering you did not desire and we'll go to hebrews 10 
uh, where are my Hebrews? And we'll just switch off that one there. Okay, verse five. So, therefore, when he came into the world, he said, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. Now, the apostle to the Hebrews is writing to explain the call of the Messiah and the call of our Lord Jesus to deal with the issue of sacrifices and offerings, which were the Old Testament rituals required for worship and for uh, forgiveness of sins. Um, and so... You can see that he's actually quoting from the psalmist here in verse 6, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. Um, and what I can see is that um, in, in this verse 5, he said, but a body you've prepared for me. And that is the, referring to the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and so he says... Uh, so he's, he's added that in, the, the, you've prepared a body for me. And he said here, <clears throat> in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. That's exactly what the, um, yeah, there he's, he's, quoting, he's, he's quoting burnt offerings and sin offerings as you have not required. Or here he says, you've had no pleasure in it. Um, then he says, behold, I come in the volume of the book is written to me to do your of me to do your will, O God. And so this psalm, which is prophesied by David, the king, uh, is prophesying about the Messiah. He's, he's maybe he's writing about his own view uh, prophetically, but it's prophetically being used by the Holy Spirit to foretell the coming of the Messiah. He says in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Yes, your law is within my heart. Now, I just want to give you a couple of pointers here, just on this scripture in Psalm 40. Firstly, the scripture says that the Messiah will say, Lo, I come in the volume of the book is written of me. We can find our destiny in the book, just like Jesus did. I believe that when he was a young child and being turned and being uh, taught to learn the, uh, the Torah, the five books of Moses off by heart before he was 13, that in reading those scriptures and reading the Psalms and reading the prophets, he learned of his calling of the Messiah. And that's why the apostle writes in uh, Hebrews 10, um, 7, he says, um, sorry, in verse 5, he says, a body you prepared for me. So the Lord is saying here, in the volume of the book, it is written me. So the Holy Spirit is saying that. And I believe that Jesus would have read that. And then here we see, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is within my heart. Now here's very interesting. If we read verse six, sacrifice an offering you did not desire. Mine ears you have opened. Now this is a phrase that refers to the bond servant. A bond servant is a slave who was under duty to work for up to seven years until the next uh, uh, setting free of the slaves of every seven years. He was a man that had got fallen into debt and he didn't have the money to pay the debt. So he had to become a slave in the household of the debtor, sorry, of the creditor. And when he worked in that uh, master's household, uh, at the end of the seven year uh, cycle, the Shemitah year, um, he was allowed to go free with his family, but he may have loved that master so much that he said, I do not want to go free. I want to serve you for the rest of my life. And so he became what is called a bond servant. And the way that a bond servant would be sealed as being a chosen serpent is that they would pierce his ears. That's where the earrings came from. They pierce their ears. And the way that the master would do that, he would take a brad oil, which is a tool used to strike a hole in wood to start off a screw or a nail. And they would use this brad oil, which is like a spike through the lobe of the ear and hold the ear in front of the doorpost of the house where he was going to become a bond slave. And they would pin his ear to the doorpost on both sides. And then he would be marked as a bond slave. The wonderful thing about it is that the apostles themselves, both Peter and John, 
and sorry, Peter and Paul call themselves bond slaves. That means love slaves. They're bound to the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's the wonderful thing. The principle is that once the ears were opened by the brattle, that the master has got the whole of your life as a bond slave. Here's the principle for us in the New Testament. If your ears are open to hear the voice of God and to obey, then the Lord's got all of you. If your ears are, here, uh, are open to hear him and you obey, then you are giving him more of your life than any response at an altar call to surrender your life. Listen and obey. Hear and obey is the bond slave sound that he makes. He says, I hear and I obey. That was the motto of uh, Dr. David Yonggi Cho, the pastor of the largest church in Korea with over 800,000 members in the capital of Korea, of South Korea. His motto was um, hear and obey. If the Lord's got our ear, he's got our hearts and he's got all of our lives. All right. Here's the second principle that you can learn here. In I, uh, verse 7, uh, in, in Psalm 40, verse 7, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me. Jesus discovered his destiny in the scriptures. And I'm sure that when he read Isaiah 53, he realized when it was time, he realized he's got to be crucified. That's when he started telling Peter in Matthew 16 that he's going to go to Jerusalem and be taken and crucified. And Peter says, no, not over my dead body, Lord. And the Lord Jesus turned to him and said, get be behind me, Satan, because you prefer the things of man than rather than the things of God. Let me tell you that when he read the scriptures, the revelation of the spirit confirmed to the heart of Jesus that this is what he would have to do. And in uh, Hebrews 10, verse 9, it says, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God. He's come to do your will, O God. And the, the point that the apostle is making in, in the book of Hebrews is that Jesus became both the sacrifice and the high priest. Jesus became the sacrifice for our sins, but after God raised him from the dead, he became the high priest to represent us and to open the way for us to go to the throne room, not just to go to the cross. Now, here's the difference. You've got to get revelation on this, that the pastors and the evangelists and the teachers who do not see this keep taking people back to the cross to help them to understand their justification. But it will be prophets and apostles and teachers who have got this revelation that we do not have to stay at the cross. When we get victory over sin in our lives, there is a way that is open for us in Hebrews chapter 10, which you'll see down here in verse 20 onwards, a new and living way, which is consecrated for us through the veil, that is his flesh. It says, uh, therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way. And it says that uh, that our hearts um, our hearts are sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies are washed with pure water. The, the way that the Lord made um, for us to access the throne of God is the way that he is replaced going into the tabernacle of Moses. We now go before the throne of God in prayer because Jesus made a way for us. Now that's wonderful because the, we then can start to see what is the will of God for our lives. That we, we have to come to the cross. But once we've uh, embraced the cross, and as Jesus said, take up the cross daily, so that as Paul writes, reckon yourself dead indeed to sin. In Hebrew, in Romans 6, um, and in another place in Corinthians, he writes, um, I carry the sentence in, uh, of death in my life. I die daily, he says. That principle of the uh, the verse, uh, Galatians 2, verse 20, where he says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But, the, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The original Greek says, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And 
uh, who loved me and gave himself for me. So that experience can be ours, and we can read that our destiny is in the book. Our destiny is to experience these powerful new creation truths that can become reality in our lives. The word can become flesh again in us so that we see what's in the scriptures. And we say, that is speaking to me just as it worked in Paul's life. It can work in my life that I can live that life of being crucified with Christ. So there's an exposition of those two sets of scriptures that I've listed there. Um, Hebrews 10, 5 to 9 and Psalm 46 to 8. So um, the, the personal plan that God had for Jesus can also be unfolding for us to walk in the footsteps of Jesus and even to walk in the footsteps of Paul of what God in his, God did in his life. So we must appropriate that, but the, the specific personal plan of God for us will have to do with our gifting and our calling and our destiny. Um, but Peter, when he was concerned about what ministry John would have, he says, if I, Jesus said to him, if, if I choose to let John tarry till I come, what is that to you? Follow me. And of course, we all know that John the apostle was the longest living one. He died of natural death after he was isolated and exiled in the island of Patmos, where he received the great visions of the revelation that he recorded in the book of Revelation, the last one in the Bible, the last one in the New Testament. So Jesus had different plans for the lives of Peter and John. Everywhere we look in the universe, intelligent planning is apparent. The arrangement of planets, the arrangement of the stars and of individual designs of each snowflake and flower and insect and every animal, they're all designed differently. Um, and these all reflect God's planning that the lion and the elephant and the impala and the kudu, they can live in a certain environment in Africa. Um, and different animals live in different environments. And God has designed all of this to be suitable and to be mutually interdependent. So given this evidence, we must conclude that the divine creator has also an individual plan for you and me, the highest of his created beings. So God promised in Psalm 32, 8, I will instruct you and teach you in the way which you should go. I will guide you with mine eye. So as an individual path, pathway is indicated in this verse, Psalm 37 states that every step of a righteous man is ordered by the Lord. Look at what it says, Psalm 70, 37, verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. So the same word used here for ordered is used in Psalm 8, verse 3, where it says, where it says in relation to moons and stars, which God created, um, it says that the same position that has scheduled the movement of the planets orders the steps of believers. The same position orders the steps of believers. And this is how we would walk in the footsteps that the Lord has walked before us. I use the phrase, we need to walk so close to Jesus that we must walk in the warm footsteps of Jesus the warm footsteps of Jesus. We need to be putting our feet where he walks ahead of us so that we go where he goes. We stop where he stops. We stand where he stands. We sit where he sits. We need to learn how to be so close to the leading of the Holy Spirit that we're walking like that. And this is how it happens. Your ear shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk ye in it. When you turn to the right hand and when you turn to the left hand. God's orders are not just for the big events of life, but for each step of our lives. God's will is not man's way. God's will is often contrary to the ways of man. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. In Isaiah 55 and 8 to 9. So God's will is not always the path that you would naturally select. This is why it's important to recognize the voice of God. 
But this does not mean the will of God is something which will bring unhappiness, as the next point reveals. God's will is good. <clears throat> Just excuse me, take a, a little drink here. The Bible teaches that God's will is good. Psalm 37, 23 states that you'll delight in the way that's ordered by the Lord. That Paul confirms God's will is good, and he says, and do not be confirmed to this world, conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Romans 12, verse 2, that is. God's plan is good. God's plan is also progressive. Ephesians 2, 10 says, we are his workmanship. We are his workmanship. And uh, I want to just show you that uh, verse in Ephesians um, 2, verse 10, because it's so powerful. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll copy that up here so we can see it. Okay, right. I'm going to put it up here. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. Oh, no. Um, look at what this verse says. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's as easy as walking with Jesus. And as you're walking with him, he will open the way for you to find the good works that the Lord has prepared for us to do. Just walk with him. And from day to day, you'll walk into the places where God wants you to be. You'll, you'll meet the people God wants you to meet. You'll talk to the people God wants you to speak to. And you should use those opportunities to minister grace to people, whether by prayer or by just encouraging them, speaking to them as a friend or giving a smile to a person in the supermarket. God can use us everywhere we go. So God's plan is progressive. We are his workmanship. The word are is the present tense. We are. His workmanship is constantly working in your life. It's a continuing progressive process of revealing his will. So it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. That's Philippians 2.13. God is wanting to motivate you to do his will and to do his good pleasure. Paul wrote to the Hebrew believers in chapter 13, verse 21. Well, this writer, this author of these notes believes that Paul was the was the author of the book of Hebrews. I, I tend to think that Silas, the scribe, was probably the, the author because Silas, the scribe, was trained as a Levite, as a Levite priest, and he was a scribe, and he traveled with Paul on his second missionary journey to go to Galatia and into Thracia. And so he knew Paul's doctrine, and so it's, it's possible that Silas wrote it. There's not sure or certain that Paul wrote it, but it certainly is Paul's doctrine, I think, that Silas picked up from Paul. So this is what the word Hebrews, 11, uh, Hebrews 13, 21 says, um, that it's God's desire to make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. So working is in the present tense. And it's continually guiding, guiding you, developing you, and speaking to you regarding his plan. You are promised continual guidance. The Lord shall guide you continually, Isaiah 58, 11 says. So there's going to be two divisions of God will, God's will that we can see. When we speak of knowing God's voice, we must understand there are two basic divisions of the will of God. Each division is in harmony with the other. The first is 
that will revealed in his written word. The will that is revealed in his written word. This is the will of God specifically revealed in the Bible. We, we discussed three meanings of the will of God in the previous chapter, but here there is a, we learned that there is, there we learned that there's a sovereign will, there's is God's individual will for our lives, and there's God's moral will, right? These are shown in the following diagram. God's sovereign will is over all, and God's moral will and God's individual will fall within the realm of humanity so the will of god for each individual always falls within his sovereign and his moral will as revealed in his written word so god has revealed his moral law and his moral will or his commandments and precepts in the scriptures from old testament to new testament right and we have to abide by the witness of the spirit when he brings those revelations of scriptural truth to us whether it be through any another fivefold ministry that is teaching or preaching or just talking, or whether it's revelation directly to yourselves to understand the scriptures, we have to submit to the revealed will of God from his word. And that the written word of God includes the complete revelation of his moral will. It's captured uh, all the revelation because the, the uh, Paul writes and says that uh, the scriptures are, 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 are inspired and is um, is appropriate for reproof, rebuke, and for instruction in righteousness. So all that we need is in the Word of God to instruct us in the ways of God in the ways of righteousness. So this includes all the commandments as to how you should live. And you can see there's a diagram on the next page where God's sovereign will includes his moral will. It is, um, uh, excuse me, the diagram above, God's sovereign will includes God's moral will and includes his individual will because it is, it is under the umbrella of God's sovereign will. God works all things according to the counsel of his own will. So the written word of God includes portions of his sovereign will, which is chosen to reveal to us. And this includes the general outline of his master plan for the world and mankind. So the best summary of this plan is the key verses for this chapter. Ephesians 1, 9 to 11. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which is purpose in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his own will. Now, um, uh, we have a, an API video that we've put out, and I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Nicholas to send a link to that video to you because we discuss this dispensation of the fullness of times in it and how I believe and I think we believe in API that we are in a turning point of history which began with the COVID epidemic and then the, the government lockdowns where the Lord shook every nation, every government, every household, every church, and he shook the heavens as well. And I believe that just like God wanted Noah to prepare to go from the old uh, history before the flood to establish a, a, a new family after the flood, he was God's administrator given the, the uh, prophetic revelation to build an ark that would take all of the animals and his family. And so Joseph was also given the revelation of how to rescue the nation of Egypt. And his prophetic gift and his administrative gift were used as an administrator to manage the whole empire of Egypt and to rescue his own family and many families of the kingdoms around Egypt. So I believe that God wants a new generation of administrative people that are walking in the fullness of their vocational gifting to be what they are, even if they're in business or if they're in school teaching, education, university, or if they're a policeman or a lawyer, or if they're a doctor or a nurse in hospitals, I believe that God wants them to be directed by the Spirit in this way so that they will function in their fullness of their natural vocational gifts, according to Romans 12, 
um, six to seven and eight, um, as well as their spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit will give them. And some of them will be called into the fivefold ministry that may find its uh, its harvest field outside the walls of the church in bringing new laws to pass to bring righteousness into the nation or actually establishing new schools or establishing new universities or establishing um, training for um, the for people in many different professions uh, to bring righteousness uh, of the kingdom into the earth through the work that they do so i believe that this this verse of the administration of the times uh, is a significant one, and I agree with it being an indication of the sovereign will of God, because God's will is at the end of times, in the administration of times, is to gather things all together in Christ, in heaven and on earth, even in him. And we have obtained an inheritance because we are predestined according to the purpose of him doing this and working all things after the counsel of his own will. So you can look at for further study and sections with specific reference, which is other examples of God's will. So the second division of God's will is that that is the will that is not revealed in his word. The second division of God's will is that which is not revealed in his word. And this includes the individual life plan for each believer. God's word does not reveal your specific life ministry or occupation. It doesn't reveal what church you're to attend, who you're to marry where you are to live, etc. But each of these decisions is important. It's for those sort of decisions that you must seek God's will and be able to hear his voice when he speaks to you. So we compare these two divisions of desiring to know God's will in regard to certain life situations. First, study the scriptures to see if specific guidance is given in the written word of God. There's no need to seek God's will or ask for confirmation of his will when it's already written in his word. You just read it, get the inspiration that this is what he wants for you, and then believe it and walk in it, practice it until the word becomes flesh in you. Then you examine the scriptures carefully for specific guidance that's been already given. That's what the Berean Christians did. But accepting the written word of God's voice speaking to you is, is imperative. You must accept it. If you re refuse the guidance God has given in his written word, you open yourself up to deception. So in many situations, the Bible provides general principles, which if you understand, it will lead you to a decision that's consistent with God's will. These principle, principles apply to a variety of specific situations. For example, Paul says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what concord has Christ with Satan? Or what part has he that believes with an infidel? So this, this uh, scripture gives the general principle that believers and unbelievers should not be yoked together. That means that you shouldn't be yoked into partnership with uh, an ungodly businessman. Um, you, but sometimes... Um, you can find godly people who are not yet people that are baptized in the spirit and go, don't go to the same church as you. But if their heart is righteous and their business practices are righteous, then you can uh, you can work in partnership with such people um, because you can learn to trust them. So um, let me just let me just put these on because that will help me to read this better. OK, so. <clears throat> We need to search the scriptures for biography, biographical examples which apply to our situations. Study the lives of the Bible characters to see what decisions they made in your situation and if such decisions were in harmony with the word of God. So wherever guidance is not given in the written word of God, the Lord has other methods by which he speaks to man. We're going to examine those in the following two chapters, but remember Guidance for individual life situations always will agree with the written word of God. God's voice leads within the limits of the written word. So this chart summarizes the two divisions of God's will. There's the, the revealed will of God, which is written in the scriptures. And there's the will of God that's not revealed. So the moral and sovereign will of God is revealed in his written word. So the individual plan for each believer is not written in his God's in, in the scriptures. 
the written word includes his general will for all mankind and his master plan for the world. What is not revealed is it includes specific decisions such as life work, ministry, residence, education, marriage, and guidance in other specific situations. The written word includes specific commandments and promises to govern our living. The written word includes also general principles upon which specific decisions can be based. Some individual decisions require knowledge of what God has not yet revealed. And they can be made upon the basis of general principles, examples, and specific commands revealed in God's words. So some can, but not all. And so we need to have the voice of God. So the pattern of God's will is in Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's Romans 12, 1 and 2. So the question might be asked, what is meant by the good, acceptable and perfect will of God? We'll look at those and, and we'll discover the pattern of God's will. The perfect will of God is accomplished when a believer is in harmony with the moral, the sovereign and the individual wills of God for his life. The believer has come to accept the sovereign plan of God for his salvation through the new birth experience. He's in harmony with the moral commandments of God's written word, and he also discerned God's specific guidance for his individual life plan. That's a man that's in the, uh, or a woman that's in the perfect will of God. The good will of God is not the perfect plan of, plan of God for his life, but he, that the man or woman is within God's sovereign will and moral will. They're not disobedient to God's revealed will. They are still seeking to find what God's perfect individual plan for their life are. That's the good will of God. The acceptable will of God is where the believer is missing the perfect will of God for his life, but he's still in an acceptable area. He's living in the permissive will of God. He may not be even be concerned about God's perfect will for his life at that time, but he's living in the permissive will of God. God will allow him to uh, follow that detour in his life. So God's permitting him to live in this area, although it is not God's perfect will for him. So a person can also be outside the will of God, and that believer is in direct disobedience to God's revealed will. That's both in the scriptures as well as God's reveal, will for his life, for his individual life. So here's an example from scripture, the story of Balaam in Numbers chapter 22. Some men from Moab were sent by General Balak to fetch Balaam, who was a prophet of God. They wanted him to go with them and prophesy against God's people, Israel. God spoke to Balaam and told him not to go. Here's the scripture, Numbers 22, 12. And God said unto Balaam, thou shalt not go with them. Thou shalt not curse the people for they are blessed. So it was the perfect will of God for Balaam not to go with the men of Moab. But Balaam disobeyed God's voice and went with them. When he did, he was functioning in disobedience outside the revealed will of God. So God desired so much for Balaam to know his will that he used a donkey to speak to him and convict him of his sin. After this, God permitted Balaam to continue on with the men of Moab with orders from God that he was to bless Israel rather than curse them. Balaam was now functioning in the permissive will of God. So the journey results in a series of trying encounters with a nam with a man named Balak. These could have been avoided if Balaam had obeyed the voice of God and never gone in the first place. So we have to compare this story to the diagram of the pattern of God's will. The perfect will of God was that Balaam should not go with them with the Moabites. Balaam disobeyed and moved outside the will of God. He was not in the good will of God where the believer is missing the perfect will but seeking it. He was in complete disobedience to the voice of God. The acceptable or permissive will of God permitted Balaam to continue on the journey, even though it was not God's perfect will for him. So this brings us to the topic of walking in the will of God. So the following the born again experience and motivated by the love for God, 
The goal of the believer is to walk in harmony with the will of God. Often, the pattern of believer's conformity is thought of in terms of the following diagram. So this diagram actually shows us the straight line represents the, the will of God, right? A straight line represents the will of God. But the arrows point the direction of the believer. And so what we see is that before the born-again experienced man walks in his own way, he's going left and he's going right. But when he has the new birth experience, he starts to walk um, along the same path as the will of God. Because going this way and that way is different to the will of God. And this is just a simple diagram to explain to, to us the difference. So after the new birth experience, a believer often anticipates walking in complete harmony with God's will. Because he's a new creature in Christ, he expects to be able to confirm exactly to it. But in reality, the uh, daily life brings him into a up and down experience. So the new birth starts with him walking in agreement with the direction of the will of God, but then he can get out of step and go left and right and then eventually give, give up because he's disappointed of the will of God not working out in his life. So he has a, an up and down experience. Sometimes he hears God's voice and does it. Um, other times he's greatly discouraged when he makes mistakes and misses God's will. Some even give up and they, they lose the desire to hear God's voice. But if we look at it, we must generally see that even though he may uh, take a detour and come back, he's generally moving forward in the direction of the will of God. And God, the Holy Spirit, works with that and keeps encourages, uh, encouraging us to carry on. So we see that the overall direction of the dotted line represents uh, the life. Uh, the life walk is upward um, and the overall pattern is one of progress. So the dotted line shows how he strays from the will of God. And, and when he realizes it, he learns from the experience and comes back into conformity to God's plan, as you can see here. And though positive and negative experiences are, uh, are uh, sure to come our way, the believer continues his growth in understanding the principles of a God-directed life. So this becomes a liberating experience of a relationship with God in which you are privileged to live. The will of God ceases to become just restrictions or commandments. It becomes a challenge of learning to align your life with his perfect will. A biblical example is uh, the life of King David. It says when he first became king, he walked in conformity to the will of God. God even called David a man after his own heart. But then David sinned with another man's wife, with Uriah's wife, Bathsheba, who gave birth to an illegitimate child that died. We know that. He was in direct disobedience to God's written word. But David came before the Lord in repentance. He was forgiven and came back in line with God's will. And their second son, Solomon, became the son that God put a lot of anointing into, a lot of wisdom and understanding to rule like no other emperor in, the, in that generation ruled there was none as wise as solomon except jesus when he came he said a wiser than solomon is here so as we examine the ways god speaks to men in the next two chapters you must keep diagram two in mind that's this diagram here this is diagram two and remember that and we will remember that sometimes we take detours because we miss God's voice, right? And so what we have to do is through our experience of learning to know God's voice, whether it's positive or negative, you can continue to advance in your ability to discern God's perfect will and continue to strive for conformity despite the occasional failures. Never, ever give up. And I think that's the end of the chapter. Yes, that's the end of the chapter. So we've covered these two uh, chapters tonight and next Monday. We will cover <clears throat> the following chapters, which will be, let's get down to chapter six, starting with how God speaks to us. And we're going to learn a lot of detail there, and it's going to help us uh, along the way to put it into practice. So um, 
we ask the Lord to, to bless you uh, and to prosper you as you take these scriptures, as you work through the further study, as you do the assignments. Remember that you've got to get the assignments in. The assignments for chapters four and five must be handed in on Saturday. Um, and if you haven't already done your assignments for chapters one, two, and three, that should have been uh, submitted by last Saturday. Is that correct, Dr. Nicholas? And um, I think that's that's correct, right? Yes. yes. I just want to, if I can quickly share my screen. Certainly. Um, just I'll stop sharing. Go through. Sorry, I just want to find the document I was looking for. I've closed. Okay, yes, it's that one. Okay, so everybody would have received this document today. Um, it's obviously got um, foundations of faith. The final essay assignment uh, is due on the 17th. So I put that in there just to remind you, because obviously nobody would have submitted it by now. And then on the second page, it has the new module, uh, Knowing God's Voice. You guys would have seen then that I've updated it. These are the people that have submitted. Unfortunately, the ones in red, um, I have not uh, received your assignment on the Google Classroom or on my email. So if I can please ask you uh, if you can uh, send that through to me um, and then we can we can start looking at, at that. So that's everything from my side, Dr. Tony. Thank you for a, a lovely lecture this evening. And um, for those people also that tuned in on Vida Radio, thank you. Um, for the feedback and uh, for, for being able to join us with this lecture. Yes. So we thank you, Lord, for tonight. We thank you for everyone that's participated and everyone that has been able to hear us on the radio, if not see us on the video. But we uh, we pray for everyone that may uh, tune into the, uh, the YouTube uh, video when we release it. And we're asking for your blessing to be upon them with these simple truths that are so foundational in our walk with the Lord. So we pray that the Holy Spirit will guide each one of us more and more. And I pray that you'll bring us into a place of growing up in all things into Christ. Even, the, uh, even Christ Jesus, who is our head of the church. And we pray that you'll impart to us more of the nature of Christ and the obedience that was in Christ Jesus. I ask you to give us more of the faith and the love that is in Christ and was also in Timothy, as Paul said, that it's also in you. And we want that faith and love in us that we can receive from the Lord Jesus Christ. So I pray that for my brothers and sisters, that this week will be a week of hearing your voice and walking in obedience to see what God would lead us into day by day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you all. Amen. God, God bless you all and good night to all. Good night to all. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. Yes, amen. God bless you, Hilda. God bless you. God bless you, Esther. God bless you, Esther. Thank you. God bless you all. God bless you. Good night, then. I'm going to, I'm going to leave the meeting now. Good Thank night. You. God bless you, Weston. God bless you.